20s. Okay. Uh, so we should, I'm going to go ahead and start the webinar. All right. Well, if you have any thoughts on TikTok and things like that, let me know. Um, I'm a little wary of that, but I'm, I'm open. I, I, if you want, I can connect you with my oldest son who's turning 20. He'll tell you about it just kind of in general. Okay. How to talk, how to th think about it. Because I don't know, and you have to talk to somebody in that age range. Yep. All right, so let me go ahead and start the webinar. <clears throat> Uh, thank you to those arriving in the room. We're going to give it a few more minutes and we'll start the session. I think we can go ahead and start with the general introductions. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Alan McCoy. I am Director of Startup Support at the University of Maryland DM Ventures. I'd like to extend a warm welcome to everyone joining, it, joining us today for this in next installment in Startup Fundamentals Workshop Series. The series is offered by UM Ventures in collaboration with MTech at the Clark School of Engineering and Dingman Center at the Smith School of Business. Uh, throughout the session, please feel free to submit session uh, questions using the Q&A function and our presenter will address them at the end of the session. Uh, today, we will focus on a very interesting and uh, hardly explored topic of intellectual property in the metaverse. I am very pleased to introduce today's speaker, Raymond Van Dyke of Van Dyke Intellectual Property Law. Ray has been very kind to uh, offer many sessions uh, throughout the last, is it, has it been two years now, Ray, since the beginning of pandemic? Um, Ray is doing it as a volunteer, um, so thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, this is a completely volunteer um, operation. And uh, so thank you for coming back with these very interesting topics. Uh, so the mic is all yours. And thank you for sharing your time with us today and expertise on this very interesting topic. So I'm gonna go ahead, turn my camera and mic off and it's all yours. Okay, thank you very much, Ala. Uh, and thank you for the University of Maryland and the entrepreneur uh, group to allow me to speak today. Um, we've heard about the, the metaverse, it's coming, it's here. And there's a lot of weird aspects of law that's going to apply in this. You know, I, I gave a talk earlier today on copyright for a different group and where you have whole new technologies come in and you have the, the, the laws, which are decades old, how are these things going to mesh? So with the metaverse, we have some issues. So let's look into it. Okay, I got to do control here. And there we are. So what is the metaverse? Okay, it's the merger of the physical real world with this virtually created one in a variety of ways. It's likely to be the first multi-trillion dollar industry. And the land rush is on right now for companies to stake claims uh, in this new world. The term uh, metaverse came up in first in Neil Stevenson's 1992 science fiction classic Snow Crash, where he talked about these types of um, things when you have a, 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 a another world to walk around in. Wikipedia defines the metaverse as the concept of a future iteration of the internet made up of persistent shared 3D virtual spaces linked into a perceived virtual universe. Okay. These could be uh, seemingly real, imaginary, weird. I mean, it, it, it's the realm of human imagination is the only limits. 
there's different realities going on here in, in the metaverse. You know, there's the real aspects, the left there. There's you, you're a physical being, all right? There's the headset that you put on. There's the gloves that you put on to interact with the, the metaverse. Then there's augmented reality where you, you, you pretty much put some, something on you like smart glasses uh, or, or even your phones. These phones are sort of that where they augment what you, your, you, your being, so to speak. Okay. All right. Hold on. So uh, on the other side, there's the virtual reality, all right? For example, your avatar, your representation that's walking around in this virtual artificial world, okay? And there's also extended reality or mixed reality where you're blending the things, where you, you overlay the, the um, virtual reality over real, the real. So it might have special glasses where you have special, certain things that are overlaying things in the physical world. But anyway, now the, the current definition, so to speak, of the metaverse is this spectrum of realities going on. Now, the intellectual properties uh, are at play. There's, there's a variety of them. Patent, there's, there's, there's patents covering all the physical devices, you know, the headsets, the gloves, all these things. There's methods and systems used in the making and using of these meta inventions. There's trademarking. You know, branding in the virtual world, just like in this world, brands are effective. People are walking around in the virtual worlds. Brands can be effective there as well. And copyright. You know, people create in this, in the real world, maybe there's going to be some interesting new creations in this virtual world. And there's going to be trade secrets, you know, to protect the tools of the trade, how you do certain things and all that data. Some of the various things can be protected under trade secret. So let's look at the various sectors that are being affected by the metaverse now. All right. There's fashion. There's all kinds of fashion shows going on now in the metaverse. Okay. Of Florence, Zepetto, others, they're, they're all very heavily involved in the metaverse. Nike is heavily involved in this. Gucci. Retail is going to be affected by this. You know, uh, the local mall where I am and everything is, is the business is way down, even before COVID. So uh, it's unclear if the mall is going to exist in the near future. It's a shame, but I mean, that's just change in the world. So the mall may exist in the, in the metaverse. You may walk around in a virtual mall. That virtual mall can be infinite in size. It can offer changing things. I mean, it, 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 the sky's the limit on that. So Streetify and others where you, they present a uh, uh, a retail environment for you to go. The automotive sector, they are very heavily involved here. You know, Hyundai and others, where they introduce the new cars where you can see them, perhaps even drive them in the virtual world. Consumer electronics and banking, these things are, uh, we're already seeing banking, you know, contracting quite a bit. It's going to contract even further. And a lot of it is going to go virtual. You may go to your bank in, 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 in the, as your, your avatar. All right. I don't know about getting money out of an ATM in the virtual world, but hey, somebody will think of a way. Entertainment, media, and sports. All these things are, are, are being, there's, shift, there's a shift. Now to experience in these things more virtually, All right? Disney is very heavily into this, so uh, some some of some of, some of the more cutting edge things we're going to see out of Disney. Travel, real estate, and restaurants. A lot of you, if you if you look, you'll see all kinds of this different usages of of, of these brands and 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 these products and services in the virtual world. 
so you can travel virtually. Now, I look forward to that. You know, you, you want to go to some obscure place. It might be expensive or difficult to get to. Put on the headset and travel there virtually. Okay? And with the experiences becoming more and more lifelike, it may, in one day, it may be almost indistinguishable. Almost. All right. I don't think uh, we'll be fooled entirely, but you never know. Well, if the metaverse uh, continues to hardwiring the brain, the God knows. The manufacturing, like I said, with the overlaying of realities and everything, you can you know, see things through the headsets and it'll overlay what is uh, uh, in the real world. You can use this in, in improving manufacturing techniques and, uh, and other aspects as illustrated here. So anyway, uh, some of the issues, you know, the copyright, uh, it, it protects against the unauthorized copying of an author's work. That's the essence of copyright. That work could be the code, visual and other art, performances, and other expression. Right? The infringement remedies you know, can be huge, you know, under statutory damages and other concepts. You, you can uh, have rather significant damages if infringement is proven. Uh, what about an avatar in the virtual world using a copyrighted work? Is there liability? All right. So if the work is available in the metaverse, maybe there's potential for abuse there. So, so something like maybe like a copyright infringement claim can be filed. Yeah, but yeah, maybe it's a fair use uh, defense there. Is you know it, that it is the metaverse. This is transformative, and this that and the other you know, arguments can be made. You know, currently at the Supreme Court now, there's rather subjective analysis of uh, fair use. And the Supreme Court is of no help in that regard. The recent travesty of the Google versus Oracle case uh, is, is a case in point. So there's a potential to go after infringement in the metaverse, uh, but who would you go after? The provider, you know, it, it's a little unclear at this point. For example, if you go after the provider, that'd be something like the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which was created after the birth of the internet to protect providers in, uh, of these services from, in, from infringement suits. And so in other words, you have safe harbors that if the ISP uh, does things in a certain way, they'll, they'll be immune to direct copyright violation of the, uh, against themselves. Similarly, with the metaverse, people are going to be uh, immunized, so to speak, uh, from that contractually or otherwise. So the provider is not going to be liable if they have a notice and takedown procedures in place. All right. You know, there's flagrant misuse of a work, for example, you know, uh, and they don't take it down. Maybe there could be liability. Anyway, the, some of these issues are going to work out in the years to come. Now, now we're talking about weird things. What about creations made by avatars in their virtual realm? Okay. All right. You're, you're, you are in, you have a meeting, your, your avatar is in a meeting in the virtual realm and there is some creation made there. Okay. Whatever it is. Maybe some code is written there or some kind of art is expressed there, something. So the basic requirements of copyright art has to have authorship. Okay, must have its origin in a human being. All right. There's a blurring line here in, in the copyright laws with AI, you know, because, uh, you know, many people are arguing, well, the AI created that work. Well, the copyright office does not allow AI, per se, to be authors. All right. I would argue that whoever created the code and the capability of that code would be the author if you wanted to press the issue. Okay, another requirement is that the work has to be reduced to a tangible medium, a physical form, somehow or other. You know, in the real world, that's easy. A poem is written down or typed out. Computer software code is saved to the disk. It's reduced somewhere in a tangible form. But in the virtual world, this is all virtual. Some crossover from that world to the real world has to occur in order for you to obtain a copyright right. 
under current copyright laws. We will see in future if they're going to amend such laws. Maybe if the metaverse really takes hold and uh, uh, um, all the young people in the world starts living in the metaverse, maybe the copyright laws will change in a couple of decades. I don't know. I dread, I dread that happening, but it, it, could, it could happen. Okay, uh, policing the metaverse. Okay, like with the internet now, the ISPs and the providers, you know, they have to police to see, you know, if there's uh, abuse, there's, there's copyright violations, or whatever going on in, 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 in the services they're providing. It's very difficult. It's going to be, it's difficult in the metaverse as well, you know, and uh, so you're going to want to look at the licenses and um, um, uh, intent to allow use of a work in, in the metaverse. So if you have a creative expression, uh, you may want to check licenses and things like that to see if there's uh, uh, allowance to use that work in the metaverse. Maybe you want to cut that out, or maybe you want to improve that and make it happen. So there's, a, there's different ways of, of looking at this. Currently, you know, we have, uh, you know, the Second Life and Alternative. This has been going on for well over two decades. Uh, Second Life is one of the earliest ones. Uh, and the issue has come up already of liability of avatars in the, in the virtual world. You know, virtual crimes and things like that. Does it spill over to the real world? They're actual crimes. And that, that's sort of true. Yeah, it, with Second Life, there was a, a lady who um, uh, was very into Second Life. There was a, even a movie made about her and everything. Uh, but uh, what she would do, Second Life, is um, have a little shop when your character enters Second Life. You pay the fee, whatever, you enter into this virtual reality of Second Life, your character is new, okay? She would sell little programs that would put clothes on your character. Okay, it sounds simple enough and everything. And, you know, so you would say, I want uh, this, you know, uh, at the bottom right there, certain clothes for your character. And she would sell you the program to run to clothe your character. Okay, so she had many dozens of these. And another person that was in Second Life did not like the fact that he had to buy this from her. So he hacked into her system, stole the program apps, and posted them on the internet and made it available for everybody. So it ruined her business. So there was a litigation involved with that and this, this cyber theft, all right, was, 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 was um, punished and she got over $100,000. So it's already a reality. Now with non-human creations, I touched on this with AI and all that. This is already an issue uh, in other contexts, you know, animal art. Elephant paintings, monkey selfie here. That's the one at issue now. David Slater, yeah, he had a, uh, uh, a, a camera he set up in the wilderness and the monkey is the one that took the picture. So again, under copyright law, the author of a work. David Slater did not author the work. Technically, the monkey did by taking the picture. He was the actor instigating that. So what the copyright office says? Copyright office says, we're not going to go into that. You know, anything produced by nature, animals or plants, not allowed. There has to be a, a human being, all right? No divine or supernatural beings and everything. It has to be a human being that is the author. So with the David Slater suit, it, uh, PETA got involved, uh, representing a monkey and this, that, and the other. And it, it became a, a bit of a mess, which we'll see in the next slide. But the but computer algorithm creations, like I said, you know, you know, artificial intelligence or, or or smart systems and things like that, they're already creating things. And this, this is an issue. It's pushing up against the copyright law. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. All right, so we've already had instances <laughs> with 2001 with that. But um, anyway, uh, with, let's say let's look at the, uh, some recent things with the gaming industry. Epic Games is a very popular game right now, uh, and they have what's called the Fortnite Saga, which is a, a really popular game. So 
at the end, you go out, it's like a D Dungeons and Dragons uh, adventure. You go out on a campaign, you come back and, and Epix uh, says that, hey, maybe you want to do a celebratory dance. Your character does one, all right? So they have a, 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 a listing there, a representation of the various dances to do. Some of these, you know, the, the Millie Rock, they, they swipe it. And then there's the Alphonse Ribeiro, the AKA Carlton Banks on the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. He did a dance called the Carlton. Well, Epic Games has made this into uh, a character dance called Fresh. So is this a copyright violation? Hmm? That's the question. Fortnite, also with Russell Hornig, the backpack kid, he came on and, and did this, this floss dance. There he is with Katy Perry. So they had a floss emote there representing that. Is this copyright violation? So what are the, the law here, the Fortnite saga, do they violate copyright law? Do simple dance steps constitute choreography under the copyright laws? So your characters do things in the metaverse. What kind of copyright violations can they have? With dance steps and things like that, you know, there's all kinds of things in history, the fox trot, the waltz, yeah, you know, probably the copyright has gone out of these things, but can you get a copyright in some of these things? For the copyright office, individual movements or dance steps by themselves are not copyrightable. The last major copyright act, 1972, 1976 act, is unclear on this point. Complex choreography, of course, can have copyright protection, as well as the individual aspects that read West Side Story, things like that. You know, the dance routines there, uh, the, perhaps even the dance steps and things like that, I'm not sure where you draw the line there, but um, uh, complex choreography is protected. You just can't, as an individual, take and co-op simple moves, simple human movements or dance steps. You can't do that. That's part of the public domain. Okay, and with trademarks, all right, uh, it protects against unauthorized use of a mark, all right? There's, is there reasonable consumer confusion as to source? Who's the endorser, the maker, things like that? Is there confusion on that point? That's the crux of, of trademark law. So if your avatar is driving a Porsche, okay? The Porsche is a well-known car. And let's say your avatar is well-known. Is there, is this an association? You know, can this be confusing? Let's say somebody is, is a famous movie star or whatever, and somebody uses their likeness to drive a Porsche. Is there an assumption that this actor is associating themselves with Porsche? These kind of weird things can, can crop up in copyright law. Is there some kind of confusion going on here? An avatar wearing Ralph Lauren clothes or Louis uh, with Fawn's shoes or, or whatever. So uh, it's analogous to incidental use of, of brands or marks in, in film and television. A little hard to protect and everything. So, but if there's too much, if there's confusion or, or misuse, you can go after it. Okay. The better argument for brands, if they want to use their brands, as we're seeing many are already doing, uh, you want to be sure it's responsibly licensed in the metaverse. Okay. Support trendsetters, perhaps. Go after you know, where, where your, your, your brand's gonna, you know, get a bang, so to speak. This is similar to licensing, you know, the sale of toy car Porsches. Porsche can support this in, you know, with toy cars and all that. So it's a similarity to that, it's a different context. Uh, there's no digital millennium copyright type protections. Uh, this is trademark, not copyright. Uh, but you do have, in trademark, you do have the anti-dilution uh, where well, you have a famous brand, you don't want it diluted or interfered with or confused in, if it's used inappropriately in the digital realm, all right? So what do you do if there's flagrant misuse? You know, you, you ask the provider of this metaverse to take it down, remove that avatar. I mean, uh, it's hard to say. There's recent Tiffany versus eBay case that um, uh, there's no liability contributory liability if they're unaware of this and, and all that. So metaverse owners can uh, uh, best avoid famous brands. All right, be a, that's an easy thing to say. Avoid the famous brands, well-known brands, everything with the potential to tarnish or blur 
uh, those brands. You'll be, you very much could be sued. Okay, currently there's lots of use of brands in, in virtual reality. Uh, it, there's, a, there's as, as I mentioned, there's the shift going on to digital realms and Facebook acquired Oculus in, back in 2014. Okay, it was the Pokemon craze back in 2016, if you remember, where you had to travel to certain geographical locations and put on a special headset and you would see the Pokemon there. Uh, this caused a little bit of a stir and um, uh, <laughs> a lot of confusion. But as I said, you know, Mercedes, Oreo, NASCAR, all this are, are using virtual reality ads now. And um, um, it, it, there's... Uh, if you're if you're trade again, if you're trading on the mark in the virtual space, using it for your own personal game, that is not going to be uh, a, a a good thing. It's not it, it's not fair use in the sense of copyright, but it's not going to be deemed to be a legitimate use. Okay, I couldn't resist to go a little bit beyond intellectual property. There's other types of liabilities that could easily occur in this new realm, you know, torts in the metaverse, personal injuries. You know, focusing first on the equipment, the tangibles, right? The head-mounted display. There could be deficiencies with that. Uh, for example, your vision is, is completely co-opted. You're walking around with this, this headset on, but if you walk out the window, all right, there's an assumption of liability issues are going to be in there as well, but uh, there are already these these odd issues. Uh, what about you're in this and it's, it's stressful? You get a heart attack. Is is there liability for this? You put the user into a situation to generate a heart attack. An argument can be made. What about a simple thing like nausea? You know, you do have you're you're co-opting your your body's ability to orient itself in space. By putting the headset on and giving it a new orientation, sometimes there's a mismatch in that, and we're going to see some of the patents that try to minimize that mismatch and mimic the real world as much as possible. All right, but still, you could get easily get seasick, as it were, doing this. There's also a dish addiction, depression. Yeah, we're already seeing that with games and things like that. So, there's also negligence and product liability claims that can be. Uh, brought in a variety of other contexts. What about privacy or data mining issues? You know, there's all kinds of um, uh, hacking available, credit card issues, personal information. That's the easy stuff. What about your avatar? You know, your, let's say you make your avatar very similar to yourself, your body characteristics and measurements and everything. There's, that's personal information. But if you scan the user's face and 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 put your face and, and everything into this into the into the virtual realm, all right, that's your personal information. There's there's data associated with that. That's private. What about tracking the avatars? If you're walking around in the virtual space and everything, and it's it and the system is monitoring where you look. So if your head your avatar head turns and sees an ad, and it stays at that ad for two seconds. That's data that could be sent to the uh, manufacturer and things like that, so, or sell to advertisers. So this thing that a lot of these issues are, are in there. What about crimes in the metaverse? We saw a little bit about that you know, earlier, but, the mis but this is different. This is misdeeds by avatars against other avatars. That's similar to real life crimes in a way, you know, theft of virtual goods, and conversion of that to real money. You know, you steal something some, uh, that's in there and you, you somehow you convert it into the into real money, right? What about avatars groping each other? Uh, you're thinking that's crazy. Well, you know, it could cause emotional harm to another person. There is a case out there right now. Um, uh, uh, a woman was playing this game and everything and some other character groped her character and this caused her uh, distress. So I mean the, you can imagine the oddness of society that we're in playing out in the metaverse about horrible things like murder or rape. These are but in the avatar space. I mean this is weirdly 
possible. And uh, uh, your avatar can be killed or whatever. And what if it's uh, done in a certain way that um, you can't reproduce it or something? But in either of it, it's a, it's a capital offense. You know, what about post-traumatic stress? I mean, from this, from this, this, these crimes, these are all possible later uh, lawsuits based on living in the metaverse. Now, what do you do with these people that do these horrible things? Is it like going to be like a notice and takedown procedure? Uh, removal of offenders? What if they're repeat, repeat offenders? I mean, the, these, all these things have to, to be worked out. So how is the how are the providers going to protect themselves? You know, you, you're spending the money to provide this and, and make this universe happen. You know, you're going to try to limit your liability. You have service terms. You see these contracts you sign that have page after page. You just hit accept. You know, you're probably going to agree to arbitration, you know, class action waivers, and things like that. There's all kinds of other um, uh, liabilities that are going to be uh, taken care of. Okay. Um, the patents, uh, you know, it, these protects against unauthorized use of a patented idea. You know, again, exclusivity in the making, using, and selling, and importing of the patented item itself. There's strong requirements to obtain patent, but there's strong rights as well. You want to patent the hardware and the software uh, of the metaverse, right? The hardware can be, again, the headset, the gloves, haptic devices, how you connect to this virtual world, sensors that orient yourself. There's all kinds of physicality that can be patented for this. The computing power necessary for this is intense as well. So you can have specialized CPUs to handle these computations, special batteries for this equipment. There's all kinds of physicality patents that can be uh, um, made here. For example, in the connections, the connections have to be real time. You have to almost instantly interact. And the better you mimic real actions to the virtual reactions, uh, the better. So that, that takes computational power and communications. Okay, the physical components are generally going to be subject to patent. Okay, software and abstraction, other kinds of abstractions and everything. Right currently under the U.S. law, patent law, there's uh, Section 101 Alice decision issues, which we're going to address in a little bit. Okay. So uh, again, you generally get a patent on any new and useful process, machine, manufacturer, composition, or improvement. That's the general rule. But the problem it right now is abstraction, physical things, no problem. But intangible things. You know, like software code and things like that, they're deemed intangible, even though they're reduced uh, uh, to a tangible form. And if I save it in a drive, in the implementation, they're, they're deemed abstract. And uh, currently, many are deemed uh, ineligible. All right. Um, the, this, this issue with software began in the 70s and 80s, um, and just as mainframes, these big computers and everything, we're starting to come into four more, and cases went up to the Supreme Court. Then there was no clarity. Right? It was a, to me, it was a bit of a confusing mess. In 1998, the Federal Circuit Judge Rich, with the State Street Bank case, sort of clarified all that, opened the floodgates, so to speak, uh, to software patenting and business methods as well, and other abstractions. Yes, it created some confusion. But again, the Supreme Court was of no use on this issue back at the birth of the software era when they could have perhaps done something more to provide guidance. So after the State Street case, this is the late 90s. And I tell you, it was a good time to be a patent attorney in the late 90s and early 2000s. So really good. All kinds of interesting cases came out. But there was a pushback against this. Uh, and... Um, People uh, 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 complaining about this, and then there were you know, lawsuits and, and things like that. So there was a gradually it became a focus on Section 101. People say these types of software and business methods, these are not eligible for patenting. All right. 
So the big, the big companies didn't like the large uh, judgments against them and all that. So they, they, they took cases up on the Supreme Court. And one of them was the Alice case uh, is 2000, uh, uh, 2012. This was the Supreme Court's renewed attempt to resolve the abstraction issue. And again, to me, they have failed and they're not rising to the challenge yet to address the issue again. Okay. So that, what does that mean? Right now with district courts, you know, they're happy to dispose of a patent case on section 101 dismissal motion, okay? You can imagine a trial court judge is got hundreds of cases, you know, criminal cases and business law cases and this and that. And, and they get this complex patent case is gonna consume two weeks of their time or more on all these weird patent issues and everything. And somebody comes at them saying, hey, we can just dispose of this case, okay? That's what the law is. It's abstract. It's abstract. You're just a, it's abstract. And then you're done. And I think this is a travesty of the highest order, but this is the law right now. Supreme Court won't clarify things. So, uh, so the point is right now, at this time, if you have a software or more abstract type invention, you're going to have these one-on-one challenges, right? Whether it's for the metaverse or for software in general. The America Invents Act in 2011 you know, provides even more challenges to patents. And I, I think that's, you know, the America Invents Act to me is another travesty, but we won't go down that road right now. So the law now has been unsettled, court's not helping, but nonetheless, technology progresses and patents are being sought. So these issues are gonna play out in the years. Okay. Let's look at what people are doing now, okay, in the patent area. All right, this is a, a Apple case. And here it's interesting, they have the, it's sort of like a glasses, but the arms of the glasses, if that's what they're called and everything, these are interchangeable. They can have different types of memory. They can have different types of capabilities in them and everything. So you can swap out, you have the, the basic glasses, but you can swap it out, power or whatever, with the, with the arms and make it do other things. Enhance it, so to speak. Here's another one, it tries to, um, uh, to minimize this mismatch between the sensory world and the virtual world. And you're, you're, you're computing the image based on all these sensors and everything. You, and you're uh, putting the photons directly onto the, the, the retinas of the individual. You're carefully calibrating everything and doing this. It's called accommodation convergence problems. So you're, you're helping to resolve these things with this dynamic three-dimensional focusing in, in this virtual reality or augmented reality world, okay? Why they want this? Well, the user, if they don't get ill or nausea or whatever, they're gonna keep playing. So this is in their interest to keep, uh, to keep going. Okay, uh, here you have, you know, they want, again, you wanna mimic the, uh, real world as much as possible, all right? So you, in this virtual world, it, it has a certain feel to it or whatever, and it has natural light and things like that. If let's say the sun is out, you wanna mimic the features of the sun, all right? And mimic the physiological attributes of that, all right? The user's gaze, you can't look at the sun. So you wanna you mimic a lot of these things and adapt the user's eyes to the particular surroundings that you want them to experience in the virtual world. Uh, this one involves the eye tracking. Like I mentioned, there's gonna be a lot of value and money involved in, in keeping, it's not only um, uh, useful in, 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 in your, you as a user using the head, phones and tracking, better tracking with the eye gaze over there, but in this data. So, but here is something where you can, you, 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 you want to watch the gazing and, and, and make controls without touching. You know, for example, um, um, uh, even Hawking, for example, he had a special glasses and everything where he could gaze here and there and, and, and do some commands visually. So that's what they're doing now with this. You have the goggles and everything, and you'll overlay that with some commands perhaps uh, on your screen. And if your eye settles on that for two seconds, that function will be enabled. 
so a lot of these things are happening. I did a lot of some similar, similar types of this work in grad school. Um, here is an example of something with uh, when you have uh, extended reality or mixed realities, uh, uh, different environments and everything. Uh, you want to overlay that in such a way that it, it, it helps the user. All right, like with the manufacturing and things like that, you have an image of a machine, you overlay that uh, with the virtual aspects uh, to, to better enhance your work on the machine. Um, here's a technique for <laughs> attenuating uh, correspondence. You have the, all your virtual reality regalia on and everything. And your, your avatar is doing what you do. And you say pretty much, I want to go for a bathroom break or do something else. You can sort of like flick a switch and there's a, it disconnects you from your avatar. <laughs> a physical muting, as it were. Your avatar is still there. Maybe doing something else, I don't know. But it's not doing what you're telling it to do. All right? So you're switching context, so to speak. Here's another Apple case where um, it, not only the light, I mean, when I was in grad school, I mean, computing the light and what, what a viewer sees in a virtual world is an intense, there's a lot of intense amount of computation that goes with that. I mean, it's, it's astounding if you, if you really dive into it. But just as the just as with the light rays, you have to, if you want to mimic the real world, you have to mimic the sound. If something falls half a mile away or makes a sound a half a mile away, you don't hear it instantaneously. All right, there's a delay. And you've got this pattern addresses uh, mimicking the sound effects, as it were, from the real world into the virtual world. Now, let's switch to over to Walmart, all right? Virtual shopping. Walmart is trying to provide a omnipurpose store for you to go to. They have, you, know, you enter the store, there's a virtual greeter, Your av an avatar greets you. There's an information source and a direction to the virtual stores within this, uh, this site. You know, for apparel, shoes, watches, jewelry, cosmetics, whatever. So let's say that uh, uh, you want to uh, get close, all right? You get the customer's body measurements. You depict the user in the in the screen there, and you you put the specific product on their avatar. You can change the sizes. You can change the colors and things like that. And again. This gets back to my point earlier. If you mimic your physical being to the uh, uh, shape of your uh, avatar, then you can do something like this. Okay, or you, these are, or you can these could be virtual clothes for your avatar. But in this in this instance, it's correlating it to clothes for yourself. But you can see them on your avatar. Okay. And there's a smart mirror there where your avatar can sort of see. So anyway, it, it'll tie in with sales, events, and things like that. So it's all, it, it's this, this one-stop shopping kind of thing going on. So again, you get their body measurements. You get to pick the user in the uh, different sizes, colors, like I said, expressions on the face, backgrounds to see how, you know, how it would, uh, uh, in this case, a dress, how, they, uh, how, how it would look in different contexts and all that. And you can link all of this to your payment schedule and all this and, uh, and everything. Okay, here's another patent on uh, uh, a, a more immersive experience, okay, like remote tours I mentioned before. You know, a remote room is, is scanned in detail. Okay, for for a virtual tour. So here you are. You're with a, perhaps a group, and you're there with your headset on, exploring the virtual room, which is an identical to the actual room. All right, you do it in your own home, your own space, but it can be highly immersive because right? it's so detailed. All right, 
uh, this is really useful for museums and, and places like that. Yeah, you know, I, uh, I I mentioned in a previous uh, lecture that you know the National Geographic has something like this. You know, I saw it a number of years ago. Uh, it, it really mimicked the uh, uh, the actual room. And uh, so anyway, these are kinds of places where you can go National Geographic, Geographic, and other places where you can see this technology and work. But it is available now with it with the headphones and other things. I mean, with the the goggles and everything. Okay, there's another case of uh, video conferencing. You know, we're all, you know, talking heads uh, and this, that, and the other. And, you know, current video, you know, you have a, a bunch of icons up there. You're all talking to each other and everything. But this takes that to another level where you have a defined space, virtual space, and your icons are there, but uh, it, you're all sharing this, this virtual 3D space, okay? So you all have a sense that it's a space. It's not, you know, two-dimensional, like you're all looking into the two-dimensional. You're there in, a, in an environment. You're interrelating with each other. You can see their faces in this environment. It's, it's more of a social experience, taking video conferencing to the next level. So to speak. Uh, here's another one. Uh, has to do with... Uh, uh, the interesting thing, where you have artificial intelligence, and I don't like using that term, because it's not, uh, to me, artificial intelligence means a synthetic consciousness, but uh, artificial intelligence means now everything, including smart systems and things like that. So here you have a technique for um, training your smart system to do more functions, all right? So you put on the, the, the headphone, uh, the, the, you put on the goggles and everything, and uh, you train your virtual, you know, you're, uh, there you are on the right, uh, with, uh, and the two of you are, you're training the virtual versions to the left, how to operate the machinery in a certain way. So you can use this uh, virtual reality concept to do training uh, or simulation, simulating things to create a smart factory, so to speak. Okay, and as many of you know, patents have claims, okay? You wanna claim, you're claiming aspects of making, using, or selling the invention. These are the exclusive rights, okay? But again, now we have the threshold for every invention now that's being litigated is eligibility, section 101. Can you even reach infringement nowadays? Does the motion to dismiss are, are done early? And the, the case is just removed from the docket. Judges love this, right? So complex technologies and complex legal doctrines are tossed away e easily, right? And the current uh, Supreme Court test is the so-called Mayo Alice test. So here's an example of it. The top there uh, is, is the statute, you know, is the claim to a process machine manufacturer or composition of matter. Okay, that's... It, it has to be one of those by default. Now, the first part of the Alice test is the middle one there called step 2A. That's the first one. So it asks, is the claim directed to a law of nature? Can't have that. A natural phenomenon? You can't have that. Or an abstract idea? Now, the other two, the other two are fairly clear. You know, a law of nature, yeah, that's fairly definitive. I don't, I don't think there's much ambiguity in that. Natural phenomenon, you know, we know what that is, lightning, rain, or whatever, or plants, and or, or whatever. There, there's all kinds of natural phenomenon going on there. But this abstract idea, to me, is, is rather subjective, all right? So let's say it is directed towards an abstract idea. Then you pass down to step to be there, which is the second part of the Alice test, does the claim recite additional elements that amount to significantly more than, than the abstract idea, as it were? And if it does not, then you don't get a path. All right, so what the problem now is that things are entering into this Alice test and they're, they're, they're failing because the judges say, oh, it's abstract, okay. And then it's, it might be hard to show that there's significantly more 
You know, I was uh, arguing a case on appeal at the, at the patent office and everything, and this was a thorny issue. So there's a lot of litigation out there. I, I looked through a lot of it and everything. I found one case, this one case that I thought was uh, a more hopeful case for this. Okay, this had to do with geolocation methods for virtual reality, okay? And ultimately this was found not to be an abstract idea. All right. Uh, Blackbird's patent was for geotagging and geolocation. And this was uh, the, their technology. So Pokemon Go software developer Niantic uh, was, took that technology and was using it. And, and they were sued by Blackbird. And the Niantic moved normally for, hey, this is, this is abstract. Violate section 101. Move for a 12B6 motion that to dismiss this. And that, so anyway, that's what's at issue right now it, it, as we're talking about this. What's the invention? The invention was you enter a, this virtual reality situation, perhaps at a street location. And for this invention, let's say it, it, it is a small town street, there's a real small town, and you mimic that small town in the virtual reality, okay? So there's a correspondence. A direct correspondence. Okay, so that location that you enter into the game in the virtual reality corresponds and correlates to a physical location. Okay, so uh, so once the game knows where you're going to be in the in the virtual world, it goes and gets data, geolocation data from satellites and other places, and maps it out. So that you, what you see in the virtual world is similar to what it is in, in the real world. So it flushes it out based on that location. So after the, this mapping is done, including camera images of the street location, then your avatar will travel to a second location in there, perhaps a race car going through town, whatever. So you might see ads or whatever along the way. So, and it'll flesh it out along the way. Okay, that's that's the the game as it were. So let's look at the Alice case. Okay, uh, it it satisfies that it's a um, a process at the very least. But let's go to step one of the Alice decision. Is the claim directed to an abstract idea? All right, Niantica says, hey, this is abstract idea, and Niantic says that there's nothing, there's no more significance in here under, under step two. So th there's no patent here. That's Niantic's uh, argument. Okay, so for, in particular, they said that the abstract idea was this receiving location information. And they cited some other cases that were sort of, they thought on point, particularly the concatenation versus Amitrak fleet solutions. This has to do with um, um, uh, you have a weather chart and you overlay that with uh, sites for um, uh, snow, snow plows. Anyway, so they alleged that there were generic components doing abstract things. That was the allegation. District Court Andrews disagreed. All right, this guy's a hero to me. He said, the defendant is oversimplifying the claims here. Courts must be wary of categorizing the claims at a high level of abstraction where it's untethered from the language of the claims, right? Don't let the exceptions swallow the rule. If only the, most judges could be that way. So he said, yeah, with, uh, with a concatenation case, yes, in that one, the steps could be routinely formed by humans using computers, all right? There's this there's snow plow here, this, that, and the other. But in this instance, this invention in, in the Niantic case, uh, the images of the real physical place are integrated into the metaverse version. Humans cannot do this, okay? The mapping here, the claim is tethered to specific instructions on the images, camera angles, this, that, and the other. And you map that integrated into there in such a way. So this is readily distinguishable when putting dots onto a weather chart. Humans 
could do that, overlay it. So the defendant also argued, well, the claims are not adequately enabled. In other words, they're not detailed enough. They said the disclosure was too sketchy to support the sophistication of this invention. The judge said, well, that might be, but that's not the 101 analysis. Too often the judges conflate other doctrines and just say, that's abstract. It's, it's abstract because it's too sketchy. That's a different issue. All right. That's enablement issue. That's a 112 issue. All right. So the defendant also argued that the certain language, the wearing clause in the claim was inadequate. All right. It, it, it was just aspirational, so to speak. It didn't do anything. And they cited another case. And um, the judge uh, uh, distinguished it, uh, that as well. So um, in this case, the judge said it was eligible at step one. It was not an abstract idea. So it didn't make it to the additional things requirement. It, 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 it was satisfied step one of the Alice case. All right. Most litigation on this goes to step two and it fails at step two. Okay. All right, gaming is leading the way here. Epic and others are, are, are really you know, pushing the boundaries here uh, with this integration with uh, the metaverse. It's get, you know, um, it, people are becoming more and more immersed in these worlds and everything. And companies are staking claims in this. You know, we saw some of the advertising and things like that. Our lives are gonna become increasingly meta. It's a four, gone conclusion, all right? That's where our world's going, more abstraction, right? Law is gonna have a tough time to keep up and adapt to that, but in 10 years, everything everything I just talked about the old will already be in the metaverse and uh, this will be old stuff. So I think with that, I am done. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Allah, are there any questions? Uh, yes, we do have three questions. Um, if okay. we have a few more minutes. Okay, so I have it. Just... Uh, okay, uh, I see meta meal on the slide. Does that one eat a meta? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I don't know how one eats a meta meal, but uh, uh, your characters they mimic eating. I I don't know. I'm not. I'm not. I, I should. I have. I have the, the goggles and everything. I, my goggle, you know, the the Oculus and everything. I need to get into this world to experience it myself. But I can't imagine your uh, avatar needing to eat. You may eat. You may how you, you may program it to to require sustenance of some sort. All right, I don't know. There, are, yeah, there are games where you need to your characters need to eat uh, and. Uh, that probably is what it is. Well, yeah, I mean, they have games where you have to get a, a a token or something and you get extra speed or whatever. But we're talking here about eating, all right? That I don't know about. Uh, can you enforce design patents in the metaverse? Probably. If somebody infringes your specific design, I'd say design patents are, are, are would be more uh, powerful. Because they're 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 limited to a specific design, and uh, so yeah, I, I think so. And it would be more difficult to enforce software patents. Uh, seven years. Uh, okay. Yeah. How many applicants can you see? Okay, it has to do with software patent. The question is that there's a a lot of uh, the 63 percent or so are, are being invalidated, and uh, on the practicality of enforcing software patents again. Um, we can hope that there will be a change in the law, whether a congressional change, I don't, I'm getting uh, pessimistic about that, but at this point with the Supreme Court not stepping in, they I mean, they created the current mess, just like they created the mess in the 70s and 80s with their, in my view, indecision. You know, if they, if the Supreme Court in the 70s and 80s had set up some guidelines for software and played it out a little more so that the um, inventions could be more articulated and defined in a more in, in, a, in a particular way. 
then we would be okay. And then we, that way when State Street happened, it's sort of like the floodgates were open. And now they're, now the Supreme Court's reactive to that. And now they're, they're giving us confusion again. Last year, the case went up on the Supreme Court that was, well, let me back up. With, with the current Alice test and everything, first it was all business methods. Those fell by the wayside. Then it became all software type inventions. Then it became therapeutics. The therapeutics, how a regimen and everything, that's, that's abstract. All right. So those are being attacked. It's harming our nation terribly. And the one case that went up last year, we were all hoping for, was this had to do with a, an, an axle, had to do with a mechanical device. And that was rejected under 101. So if the doctrine has gotten out of control. So um, I think it is still worthwhile going after this. Not all software patents are being denied. It has to do with the, the how you claim it and things like that. So it's not everything is bad in software, but um, uh, you've got to be aware that it's going to be challenged if it goes into litigation. All right. Uh, are you aware of any transactions, licensing, purchase of metaverse-based patents? Um, I'm, yeah, I don't know aware of any particular one, but but uh, the industry is out there. I mean, I saw, I, I just gave you the names of various companies that are doing this. I mean, Walmart is really out there. Apple is really out there. And again, this is the future. So um, there you go. Another question, which companies do you say are dominating the current metaverse patent landscape? Well, I mentioned you know, Walmart and, and Apple and others. Um, uh, Meta, I'm not so sure about. Um, uh, I mean, Facebook. Uh, so um, I'm sure I, I got to do more research into them, but they're out there as well. Uh, but on the patent side, uh, I showed you some of the more prevalent patents. Any other questions? Um, I don't see any questions, but I just posted a link to an example of a meta meal. Uh, so there are multiple for those of you who have kids who play Minecraft or play them play themselves in some other games, you can actually mimic making um, making the meal and preparing it, and you actually have to mine and find food for your character. So it's um, it's real. <laughs> yeah, but does your character eat it? It it consumes it. Yes. All right, they pick it up with their with their virtual hand. And put the virtual food in their virtual mouth. Um, I don't know. <laughs> okay, don't that's know. that's that's what I was getting yeah. at. All mm -hmm. right, there's no requirement for this to be done. You know, that's yeah. why when you're in a game and everything, you just run you run over it or touch it. Your yeah. character touches it, then bing, you get the credits, or whatever. Right. Uh, but um, I can see the future where you, you, your character will have innate physiological requirements for eating energy and you'll have to satisfy that i can okay. see that happening all right um well we don't have any questions and we actually are at time so i uh, would like to thank ray for spending um yet another hour very informative with us uh thank you so much very interesting topic um and um Perhaps we will know more about this topic in a few more years when there's, like you said, metaverse will be um, a lot more widespread. Um, we'll see what happens. But thank you so much for for being one of the first people to explore it for us. Okay, then. Happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Ray. And thank you to everybody who attended and asked questions. If anybody has any questions, there's my contact information and uh, or Allah can give it to you if, if you need it. Right. All right. Thank you.